So welcome back, everyone, to the Nori Corp podcast. And uh, now a film festival, a press uh, member. Uh, today we have the directors and writers for Lilac, a short film that was shown at many films, but uh, many film festivals. But the film festival that I attended was the 52nd National Film Festival. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourselves uh, just so. You can give some background. Uh, I guess we'll go with uh, Scott <laughs> first. Yeah, yeah. No, how are you, man? Uh, thanks for having us on here today. Uh, my name is Scott Aharoni, uh, directed and produced uh, our wonderful little short, Laylac. And uh, super excited to dive deep into the uh, lovely film we made. Awesome. Yes. Yeah, um, so I... mm-hmm. You want me to, you want us to just yeah, go in a... Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, Dennis Lados. I'm also one of the directors, producers um, of Laylac, and uh, appreciate you for having us here today and of looking course. forward to answering um, all the questions. Hmm. Hi, Luis. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Mustafa. Uh, I'm a writer and one of the producers of Laylac as well. Oh, awesome. Yes, I, I was seeing you guys uh, had a good set for uh, directors. The writers were uh, a multiple. And uh, I mean, I just uh, I guess one of the first questions that I wanted to ask, was it difficult having uh, a cinematographer that's different and two directors on board slash the writer also kind of like we got to stick to the script if that was the case? Um, how was it working as a unit? to bring about this short film or did you guys just trust each other on certain shots or did you pre everything that you had? Scott, do you want to take <laughs> I, For yeah. whoever wants. Cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, filmmaking is, is just a collaborative process. You of know, course. we all came together because at the, at the beginning, we all trust each other, what we were trying to do. Mm-hmm. We all had our intentions. We all spoke about it. And we, you know, be as transparent, and as honest as possible from the beginning to the end. And we're still going through that process now strategically. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, you know, working all together, it, it was all about supporting each other's vision. We all had similar. We all had maybe different, very different visions. That's what be- that's a beautiful thing about filmmaking is that people can have different opinions, and yeah, it's absolutely. basically finding that happy medium um, to you know have the product we ended up having. And it wouldn't it wouldn't be the same if we didn't all have our opinions and suggestions of how we should go about it. And as yeah. long as everyone's collaborative and we all trust each other, we could end up finding that perfect mesh, which. Hopefully, uh, we found some of that. Yeah, you definitely did find it. I enjoyed every aspect of it, and the shots were incredible. Um, so, as I was talking to you guys before, and I believe Mustafa was the only one that I didn't mention this, these questions kind of get a bit deep because it is such a serious topic, at least for me personally, um, just dealing with COVID-19. And in New York City, which was, I believe, one of the biggest case records uh, when it was at its peak, um, so I wanted to ask you guys, was there a specific reason why you wanted to cover such a, um, I guess you could call it horrendous event in our history? Um, because for me personally, I did get COVID. Um, sadly, my uh, parents also got it and my mother got interned in the hospital. Thankfully, she is still with us. Um, but for me, it's like so lovely to see a story that shows how great the loved ones get impacted um for anyone um so i wanted to ask you if you guys had any personal experience with it or if the inspiration just was because you wanted to show the importance of staying safe and showing the impact of uh, loved ones by this i think mustafa should take it because he is the creator of this wonderful story so you know oh, let him be the uh guy who brings you that background mm-hmm. sure sure absolutely uh, well, the uh, inspiration was uh, 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 sent to me uh, in an article form from Scott. Uh, okay. When uh, COVID was, uh, we were at the beginning stages of COVID, when, uh, uh, you know, things were getting serious. And uh, Scott was, like, constantly sending me this uh, really interesting articles about COVID, to which we didn't know back then and how serious it was and all that. Yeah. But when things picked up and we were kind of, you know, hearing on the news that every day hundreds, sometimes thousands of people were dying and 
and it was literally happening uh, before our eyes and it, it was affecting us as an artist it was uh, more of uh, it, the, the story was born out of uh, uh, our reaction to what was happening i think mm-hmm. it was very uh, spontaneous thing and uh we didn't even have a chance to understand what was happening when lots of you know people around us, families, friends were kind of losing their life, and yeah. we were like, you know, there there is something to it that we really have to kind of uh, uh, comment on what's happening, and and the, the best format that we know how to do this is uh, writing and film. And thanks, Dennis and Scott, they were uh, extremely you know. Um, uh, we, we started kind of uh, changing uh, lots of ideas, brainstorming about how to go with this and how to do justice to okay. what's happening. Because as you know, sometimes you, you can, you can uh, kind of go beyond what you're trying to say. And uh, there's a danger of uh, falling uh, uh, into a, a realm of fiction more than a realism. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. really wanted to stick to that realistic uh, tone of the story and almost have that journalistic uh, comment on it. So um, that's what I would say. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely shows a, a type of that journalism where you kind of point out the seriousness of these times. Um, of course, you were saying, I forgot that at the time we weren't thinking it would get that big, but looking at yeah. it back now, it was a pretty big event. Um so uh, for one of the shots, uh, the beginning shot, you guys were out on a gravesite, basically. Uh, did you guys dig actual graves for the shot, or was did you go to an actual sighting for this film? Uh, <laughs> I just want to take this from here. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, we did dig the holes. Okay. One of the biggest challenge was finding a, a place or, you know, a graveyard per se. Mm-hmm. We attempted to try to find some in the middle of the pandemic, but kind of like our expectations of wanting to use it to make a movie was also not the best thing considering people were dying every day. Yeah. People were coming and getting buried. And, you know, I didn't think, and we didn't think people wanted to deal with, you know, oh, you guys are trying to make a movie in the middle of a pandemic. We have people yeah. dying here every day. This is a serious thing. And this is what you guys are trying to do. So Scott and I actually, I think it was Scott that proposed the idea. Well, what about, you know, I have a friend named Peter and he's helped us out a lot. He has a house actually upstate in Wyndham. So mm-hmm. Scott was like, you know, why don't you call him? He's got like 30 acres of land. Why don't we just go dig some holes up there? and you know recreate a cemetery yeah so i reached out to him and he's like look i said i don't have a problem so i reached out to a good friend of my mom's who actually happens to be in the union um for he does construction so he's worked for in the union on excavators like his whole life so i said listen come up for the weekend i'll take care of you you know feed you good food whatever and just do us a favor please we got to dig uh you know a bunch of holes for to recreate a grave site Mm-hmm. So we found two companies. We rented excavators for two days. I think it was two or three days. We went in, we found a patch of land that looked acceptable. And then we spent mm-hmm. like one day flattening it all out. And then we went up with our production designer, Anna, and we sat there in this scorching heat um, <laughs> yeah. with flies and mosquitoes and bees and everything. And flattened everything out and then measured and dug all the graves. And we tried to be re- realistic with what the graves looked like in, in COVID times. Mm-hmm. And Scott and I were using some reference photos and whatnot. And um, we just tried to make it look as realistic as possible. And a graveyard mm-hmm. that would probably be somewhere in the outskirts of New York City, but somewhere in the five boroughs. And I think mm-hmm. we were able to accomplish that beautifully. And it Definitely. really looked like a, you know, a graveyard that was freshly dug to accept mm-hmm. all the all the people that died during the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then and then and at the end of the day, you know, like we we were there, and initially we had planned like 10, 15 holes. Oh, and okay. when you go somewhere, and you and and you and you live in this area, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you're living in this environment you created, and you're looking at photos where there's hundreds of holes being dug for hundreds of bodies. We were like, this isn't this doesn't do it justice this this isn't right 
Yeah. So we ended up making 61 holes. And when we sat there, we had to like live in this environment. And the first day we arrived on set, we know we did it right. And we know the extra effort was put in properly. We yeah. got on set that first morning. It was dusk, kind of dark out. Keep on taking our iPhones out because there were so many holes in the ground that people couldn't see. Yeah. But the somberness, the reality that people only see on the articles, they see on the newspapers yeah. and the news. Now it's a reality. Now you see all these holes. You don't. You typically don't see that no. in, in real life, and you never see it in person. People weren't even allowed to go to their own family's funerals. So, you know, the set itself, that construction process, was paid off because of how everyone was able to set right in. Realize this is mm-hmm. like the first job people were having since the pandemic hit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're not in their acting state. They're not in their working state. They're not. But to be here, we were privileged. Mm. A weird privilege to be in an area that resembled what was going on in our lives. It was, and it was at that moment we all felt we had a job to do. It wasn't a job to make a film. It was a job to the people who are actually through this, you know, passed away through this pandemic. It, it's yes. it's a very scary thing, and um, that's why we had to do what we had to do. No, I mean, like you said, it definitely gave. Us- oh. <laughs> you're fine uh, it definitely gave off that somber feeling of like the dialogue in that uh, specific beginning scenes was very little to none and honestly with that amount it, it just created this realism of like this is something that did happen not necessarily with this specific area but all around us we probably could imagine just so many holes i i am um, now thinking about it um I didn't uh, think to count them or give an estimate of the number, but hearing that it was 60, 61, right? It, it, that's uh, an incredible number to just work on, and especially in the heat. Oh, we might have yeah. lost. There yeah. we go. I'll explain a little something, just a little and a little tip. It always fun little oh, okay. trivia, but the <laughs> okay. 61 holes resembled the 61st day in which uh, of the pandemic oh. that Mustafa started actually writing. Um, and and getting really deep into the process. So it was a very mm-hmm. monumental day for us to throw into the film for our sake. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can build a cemetery, but, it, you know, a cemetery is only what you make of it and what you put into it and what you feel from it, what you connect with it. So whatever we needed to do as filmmakers to connect with it at a much deeper level, that's what we wanted to do. There's little tidbits here and there, but for the most part, the 61 was a strong number for us. Definitely. I, I mean, it, yeah, it definitely worked out in favor of the film. Um, for the other scenes, I know you guys were out in the field, actually shooting out in the field. Um, I believe it was, it was actually New York. I, I don't know if you <laughs> made a set for, uh, off, uh, uh, studio, but, um, I know New York is normally in, on an average day outside of pandemic days. Uh, it was very noisy, right? Um, did you guys film during the actual lockdown events up until like, say the beginning of this year where everything was kind of lighting up or um, did you shoot after where you're able to go out more in smaller groups? Um, and even then, was it difficult to record audio uh, in the field uh, overall since it's noisy? Yeah, I mean, listen, at the end of the day, um, we were kind of still at the height of the pandemic, but it was summertime. Mm-hmm. And, you know, during the heat in the summer, like things started dying down a little bit mm-hmm. and we were filming in Astoria. So life started getting back a little bit normal, but there were curfews. You know, there were still curfews yeah. at night. Um, there were still restrictions of, of what we were allowed to do. And was it loud? It wasn't New York City. And honestly, if it was, if it was normal Astoria... Mm-hmm. it wouldn't be real the story like how empty the streets were how yeah. quiet the streets were and all you could hear was the subway noise when they were underneath the subway and not people screaming and and talking and loud music playing at a restaurants yeah we wouldn't have been able to shoot the film mm-hmm. so you know as much as things were opening up a little bit people were still petrified petrified of, of what was going on and we just had to do what was right and, and 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 it worked out in our favor that we were able to shoot it mm-hmm. during that time you know yes i mean i'd say it definitely is 
a plus to have a, the ability to show that everything was basically still empty because um, it was a traumatic event. And, and I feel it leaves people up to this day very much scarred um, from being in lockdown, even if they didn't have COVID, to um, having the memory of possibly losing family members or actually losing them. Um but uh, I'd imagine with you, the majority of the scenes were with Mask, which was great. Um, the You would have the possibility of doing Foley, no? Or uh, ad-libbing and stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, no, it's it's so funny. You know, uh, we were in certain scenarios where we actually, flew, you know, typically the performances were prefer- perfect. Yeah. I think one time we, we were unhappy with something, but we liked the actual physical performance. We were like, mm-hmm. wait a second. Here's a whole new trick that we've never are ever able to do. Their mouth is closed. Yeah. So we swap one line with another, but you know, that was yeah. really only the time we were able to do it. But it was a great, great observation because it's something we never were able to do before this because mm-hmm. everyone was always showing their mouths. Yeah, of course. I, I, that's always a uh, for me when I've worked on short films that I've done or with other people. It's always that difficult thing where you love the gestures or mo- physical movement, but it's hard when the mouth you can't really sync that up uh, to perfection. Um, I mean, yeah, the the overall film was a beautiful piece and I wasn't expecting it to feel so short. And I think that goes on to the to the limited amount of dialogue, because I, at times I was like, is this still the 16 minute mark? I'm like, this is this is telling a story all through the average length that you would expect. For, because for me, I've done and seen other uh, short films and interview people telling them if asking them if they were going to have a full feature length, because there's always that thing where it feels like you're uh, filming scene A to B. But this one, it just feels like a complete story. Like I, I'm left not wondering anything. Um, I have my answers. I am emotionally fulfilled by it. So I'm, did, uh, did it come to that way? You just wanted to keep it a short film? Um, uh, I, Mustafa. I, I, yeah, Mustafa. Sure, sure. Mustafa. Sure, sure. Um, so you're saying, uh, if, correct me if I understood uh, you right, but you're saying, did it come to me when I wrote it? Did I think this as a whole complete feature? Yes. Film or was it short? Was well, it it's short? always it's always mm-hmm. interesting because even when you write a short film, you almost kind of have to invent the entire world. Of and course. whether it's a short or a feature, it has to feel logical, consistent, complete. And sometimes, mm-hmm. yes, open-ended, but still within that open-endedness, you have to be logically, uh, you know, full. So when I wrote this, um, there, there were a lot of arguments, uh, you know, brainstorming that how, how much we need to show, how much we need to tell, and how much we need to underplay in terms of uh, dramatical moments in the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we were the the whole world is very dramatic, and but you know if you kind of play the COVID card in a way that we knew that it was just the background, that was not the reason that uh, you know uh, this was happening. The reason was that the whole relationship was this way because you know life happens to you and you can make the story in the Second World War. Or, or you can make this story in the First World War, you will still get the similar results of it. Mm. So I would say the concept is one thing, but on the other hand, the relationship and the wholeness, completeness of that is another thing. I think when I wrote it, I said, you know what? This, whatever happened, happened in the past. It's time to move on. So that was the whole philosophy that I had when once. Oh, okay. So that's how the story was finished. I can definitely see that. And I, I just love when when short films don't feel like short films. And I have that complete satisfaction. It, it, it's it's a warming Absolutely. thing when I go see these things in theaters. And you have the whole hour and 30 minute mark where you see act one, two and three play out. But it, it's a lot more <laughs> difficult to put it in, in a shorter amount, less than 20 minutes. So I, I just love it. Um, I That was basically all I have. I did have one question. So the National Film Festival ended, which is the one that I was covering. 
I had a uh, thing of asking where people can find this film, if it's out in the public or if it will be. I know you guys are a contender for the uh, Academy Award and uh, other such events um, and the Oscars, as Scott was telling me. Um, is there a place or a time that they'll be able to find it? I mean, we're still blazing through the festival circuit right now. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you keep posted on our Instagram at Laylac the Film, um, you know, we're, we're constantly posting new dates, new times, new theaters that the film is playing at. You know, thankfully, with the virtual, you know, festivals and doing hybrid film festivals, there's more opportunities to people to see films. Um, so, you know, if you keep posted on our social media, of what we what we got up to, you'll be able to see the film. But we assume the film will be public at some time next year. But, you know, um, to be determined, it's a, it's a very, very <laughs> exciting time. We're extremely grateful for all the opportunities and and places around the world that we've been able to show this film. Um, and, you know, we're excited to see what what more is to come. I mean, yeah, I'll be waiting to show it to my family members because they love these types of more dramatic, more feel good films than the normal Marvel type. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again for inviting us, uh, to interview you guys. It's such a blessing to have that opportunity. Um, if you guys want to plug anything else outside of the lilac, like your business, or if you have a studio or anything like that, no, yeah. <laughs> All yeah, right. I'm a <laughs> I love it though. We're just um, trying to grind and make a, and, 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 and make a difference in this world through the uh, beautiful art that we were able to create. And if that's, you know, if that's what we've done and that's how you feel, you know, a company, a brand, it doesn't matter. What matters is the fact that you were moved by this film. And I think that's what the purpose of this is. If, if those other things come involved, you lose the art and you know that's what we try to strive as right now and during this time especially with a film like this um it's more important about the people who have passed away who are out there working day in and day out, day in and day out uh sacrificing their safety for hours so mm-hmm. you know i think that's 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 who needs to shout out um <laughs> I, yeah so. definitely sure. i i love it i i love that um, but this has been the directors and writers of uh, Lilac, a film you can follow. I'll put the links and everything you need in order to follow this film throughout its journey uh, in the actual video after I edit it. <laughs> but thank you so much again for coming on, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Right. Bye-bye. Take care.